instantons is two. And the remarkable thing is that if we scale up this cube, then it will still only be two ways of putting the instantons in there. The plus or minus signs that we saw before in counting drains and spigots also applies here and are important for the accuracy of that statement. We can also start deforming the cube in various way as ways and still we'll only get two ways of putting three instantons into the cube. So that's a taste of what the Donaldson invariants are like. Now, using this new, in 1984, new uh, topological invariant, Donaldson could pro prove some dramatic new results. Combining it with results of Michael Friedman, he could prove that there are exotic four-dimensional spaces where you can't do calculus. You might be thinking, well, of course I can't do calculus on an exotic four-dimensional space, but not, <laughs> the point is, even the best mathematicians in the world can't do calculus on these four-dimensional spaces because it's logically impossible to do so. And for this and other remarkable results, uh, Donaldson shared the 1986 Fields Medal, and he shared it with Michael Friedman. This is, the statement here is really a synthesis of the results of Donaldson and Michael Friedman, who is also producing very deep results about the topology of four-dimensional manifolds. So all was sweetness and light, except, <laughs> except that Donaldson invariants are extremely hard to compute and interpret. It took a lot of effort to compute a few special examples. We have experts here in the audience who were leaders in this, uh, in this endeavor um, in, in following up on the Donaldson invariants, like John Morgan, and um, it, he knows, and he could tell you, that it was, a, it was difficult, it was a hard slog. So, in a sense, mathematicians hit a wall. Progress was being made, but it was slow and difficult progress. Well, that's an opportunity. And the opportunity came when Michael Atiyah asked a very important question in 1987. He asked the physicists, what's the physical interpretation of the Donaldson and Jones invariants? The Jones invariants are invariants of uh, knots, which I haven't talked about, but he asked the question about both, and both are important. One physicist that listened was Edward Witten, and he went and thought about it. And, um, his answer was that the Donaldson and Jones invariants can be computed within the framework of a Yang-Mills field theory. So for the Donaldson case, it's technically a not quite the uh, Yang-Mills theory that we use to describe the forces between quarks in, in our world, but it's, it's essentially mathematically the same kind of thing. The only difference is that there's a different set of quarks and electrons from what we see in nature, and in particular, there's something called supersymmetry. So, in the course of answering this question, Witten wrote a paper called Topological Field Theory. And topological field theory is a vast simplification of physics. It was an important new idea where you could still do physics, but at the same time, length scales and time scales do not matter. Topology is what matters. So there's no difference between yesterday, last week, 100 years ago, a billion years ago. There's no difference between your commute to work and your extragalactic vacation trip. What does matter is topology. So these theories sense things like linking circles. We can scale up those circles so that they're light years apart, hundreds and millions of light years apart, billions and billions and billions of light years apart, and so they can't communicate, but still they're topologically linked. So this has had a huge impact in both physics and mathematics. There are thousands of papers on the subject. It opened up fresh woods and pastures new, and it might even be practical. People at Microsoft Station Q are using topological field theory as a potential road to quantum computation. So all was sweetness and light, <laughs> except. <laughs> except that Witten's answer involved a quantum field theory. Computing Donaldson invariants, a la Witten, requires computing probabilities in a quantum field theory, quantum Yang-Mills theory. How hard can that be? Well, in the case of abelian field theories, that's the Maxwell theory, it's hard, but it's solvable. It's a solved problem. It culminated in the formulation by Feynman, Schwinger, and Tamanaga of quantum electrodynamics right after the war. And so then there are very efficient ways of computing in these abelian field theories. The non-abelian case is much to the nth power harder. In fact, it's not solved yet. 
So now recall that Witten reformulated the Donaldson invariance as probabilities for certain events in Yang-Mills theories and four-dimensional spaces, but computing probabilities in Yang-Mills theory is very difficult. So we seem to have ex exchanged one hard problem for another. But that opens up an opportunity. The physicists had a trick up their sleeve called effective theories. So recall, topology is unaffected by distance, by scaling things up, like those two loops. We can scale things up to bigger and bigger sizes, and we don't change topology. What happens to Yang-Mills theory when we scale things up? In Yang-Mills theory, one asks questions about events at larger and larger distance scales, and what can happen is the answers can simplify. The answers can be the same as answers to analogous questions in a different but simpler theory. Such a theory is called an effective field theory. It's a little bit like pointillism in art. So if you take a pointillist painting and you look closely at it, you don't really have a picture of what's going on. But if you step back from the painting, then you see a picture of what's really going on. So it's like that with effective field theory. So if we look at nuclear distance scales, well, it's all very complicated, this theory of Witten and Natia and Donaldson, and there are all sorts of complicated mathematical compactifications and complicated Lagrangians, and it's just a mess. Um, but now, if you step back and look at, uh, look at it on the scale of this room, that's about 10 meters, well, you don't see much. But persist. You now go to, to you know, really, really long distances, like 10 to the 500 meters. Well, clearly something's happening. And now you scale back even further, and something's going on, and even further, and it's clear that there's a picture that's emerging, and the picture is an abelian field theory, a generalization of Maxwell's theory. It was written by Zyberg and Witten, and these are called the zyberg witten equations. So the F here is the field strength of an abelian a Maxwell-like field. That's the important point. Notice that it is nonlinear. That will be important in just a moment. So the zyberg witten paper said, indeed, that viewed from afar, the Yang-Mills theory used by Witten simplifies dramatically. It's a field theory based on an abelian group. And therefore, it's much easier to work with. Now, because the zyberg witten equations are nonlinear, they still do have soliton-like solutions. These are very, very closely analogous to vortices in a superconductor. And because we can measure topology by counting, that's a theme throughout this talk, you can define new four-dimensional invariants called zyberg witten invariants by counting these vortices, just the way you counted instantons, now you count vortices. Okay, now these are not anything close to a complete topological invariance, so there's no clean mathematical argument that one has to be a function of the other, but of course they came up in the same theory, so you would expect that one set of invariants can be written in terms of another. And Witten indeed conjectured a formula for that, and uh, Witten and I wrote a paper where we derived very carefully the relationship between the Donaldson and zyberg witten invariants. I remember Edward saying to me, you know, Greg, we need to clear the air. Nobody believes this uh, conjecture. And so we, we went and we gave a very careful derivation, which is now a uh, rigorous mathematical theorem. Now, but the point is that the zyberg witten invariants are in an abelian field theory, so they are much easier to compute. It's like trying to do a calculation with Charles Babbage's engine number one or doing it with Mathematica on your laptop. So this was a huge breakthrough, and now the response of the community was very interesting. So you see, there's an interesting cultural difference between physicists and mathematicians. If a physicist gets a really good idea, then she or he will work feverishly over the weekend and then get the paper out the next week, okay? And okay, you know, the, the logic isn't quite clear and maybe the steps are in the wrong order and the, you know, the, the, the implications haven't been thought out, but it's, it's part of the, it's out there. It's part of the conversation and the physicists rush in because all of the really good and easy calculations are on sale. 
Now, if a mathematician gets a really good idea, then she or he will think about it feverishly over the weekend and over the next week and over the next month and over the next year, and all the logic is going to be you know, perfectly in order, and all the steps are going to be absolutely correct, and all the implications have been thought through perfectly so that when the paper comes out, it's like a Greek temple. <laughs> okay, so, so this is the difference between the physics and the mathematics community, but it did not apply in this case. In this case, after this breakthrough, it was the mathematicians that rushed in, and there was a mad dash after this breakthrough, and it was, this whole episode was summarized very beautifully in a masterful review by Simon Donaldson, and he begins it with this, uh, with this statement. In the last three months of 1994, a remarkable thing happened. This research area was turned on its head by the introduction of a new kind of differential geometric equation by Zyberg and Witten. In the space of a few weeks, long-standing problems were solved, new and unexpected results were found, along with simpler new proofs of existing ones, and new vistas for research opened up. So, that's what I wanted to tell you, so now it's time to wrap it up. So we began with these two basic questions in mathematics and physics, which appeared to have nothing to do with each other. I hope you now appreciate that they're actually very deeply related to each other. Now, to my mind, it also had an important sociological implication. Um, there was a debate that was raging much more fiercely in the 1990s, still to the, some extent to this day, uh, you see, physical mathematics is not without its critics. There are critics from the physics side and there are critics from the mathematics side. Now, from the mathematics side, the criticism is, well, you physicists, you never prove anything. You don't even define what you're talking about, so we have no idea what you're talking about. And, um, you know, these, these complaints are actually quite legitimate. And um, the most articulate expression of, those, of that point of view was in an article by uh, Arthur Jaffe and Frank Quinn but the tone of the article was actually quite strident. You know, they used in the abstract words like dangerous and unpleasant and destructive. And um, this elicited an immediate response from a large number of scientists, mathematicians, and physicists. The leading article was by Michael Atia. It's very cogent, very well reasoned, but to my mind, the best response of all was the subsequent discovery of the zyberg witten invariance. So we have this remarkable story where the mathematicians start with the shape, the question, the shape, what is the shape of a space? And the physicists start with a question, what is the strong force? And now they turn that into a more, a more technical, accessible kind of question, like how do we define topological invariance? And let's, well, let's use the Yang-Mills instantons to try and understand confinement. Now, that, those ideas can then be lobbed over to the other side. And, of course, the mathematicians will turn it into something the physicists don't understand. Like Donaldson invariance, the physicists will take those topological invariants and create topological field theory. This can be lobbed back to the other side. And then the, um, the physicists, they like to compute things, so okay, so there's these Donaldson invariants and some Yang-Mills theory, can we compute it? Well, you are now led to long-distance effective theory, which is the zyberg witten theory in this case. You can then lob that back over to the mathematics side, and that turns into major advance in mathematics, the zyberg witten invariants. Okay, so there's this remarkable back and forth. Okay, so what about the future? So this happened about 25 years ago, so you might be thinking, well, has anything else happened since then? And I just want to stress that this is just one story, one vignette in this much larger subject of physical mathematics. There are many other stories I could tell. There are people in the audience who participated and have participated and are participating in ongoing, very interesting stories about remarkable back and forth between mathematics and physics. You might be thinking, well, what about four manifolds? Well, let's remember that there are problems in the theory of four manifolds which the zyberg witten invariants don't touch. So this, uh, this paper was written 12 years after the discovery of the zyberg witten invariants. So there are those of us in physics who, who believe that um, 
We can still use physics to learn things about four manifolds, and there has been progress over the last 25 years. I've produced a few results myself, so is Sergei Gukov in the audience. So progress is being made, nothing like the revolution of the zyberg witten invariants, but still there are these major open problems out, out there. So, you know, that's the nature of research. You, you're, you have some hunch, you have some hopes, you have some thoughts, some ideas, you are pursuing a path, but you have no idea if you will arrive until you get there. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Greg. So we have some time for a few questions. I must not have been very clear. <laughs> <laughs> the ineffable. So, yeah, please. So, in this, like, back, in the beginning, you said these two questions and what holds stuff together and what is the shape of space is not, you know, not true and not related. Right. So you might imagine that if you have some 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 shape, you imagine it being held together by something, and as you move it around, somehow you have to make your peace with how it's being held together in time. Is that kind of uh, naive reasoning? Well, I, I don't see any direct co connection. What, would you, what you're saying actually reminds me of, you know, a, um, a failed attempt to explain the periodic table. So the origin of knot theory is actually in, a, in an attempt to, you probably know this, is an, is, is an attempt to explain the periodic table using knots of ether. So, okay, so to me those questions seem a priori unrelated, but of course, you know, a good mathematician given, given some time will we'll, we'll start imagining things and maybe, maybe another connection between shapes of spaces and forces. As I said, this is only one story in a much larger story. So if we think broadly of the shapes of spaces as, as questions in topology, then as you know, there are many, many non-trivial topological statements we can make using ideas from physics and field theory. So I guess I would generally agree with what you're saying. Anything else? Okay, well let's thank Greg very much for the wonderful talk.